I'm going to go to the bottom of page 10 to this paragraph here. The house was a former warehouse. Now, this is the house that Santiago lives in. And the fact that it's a former warehouse suggests that it's not it's not a real home. It's something that's been renovated, but it wasn't purpose-built to be a home. Uh, Santiago's father, who's mentioned right here, uh, Ibrahim Nasser, arrived with the last Arabs at the end of the civil wars. So I've um, already talked about how when the Ottoman Empire disintegrated, people who had lived under the Ottomans uh, spread all over the world because uh, when an empire disintegrates, there's chaos, there's um, violence possibly, there's no economic activity. So Ibrahim Nasser is one of the so-called Turks um, who actually might have been Arabs from places like uh, Jordan or Syria. Um, but they were called Turks because the Ottoman Empire was run by the Turks. Uh, so the Latin Americans just referred to them all as Turks, no matter what they actually were. So Nasser um, was, was a refugee. He, uh, this is Santiago's father, he arrived as the Ottoman Empire collapsed and people went elsewhere. So he arrived looking for an opportunity to start life anew. He did. This is explained. Um... It explains how he, he, he built a fortune. Uh, however, the description of the house is interesting because there's lots of details like this warehouse that was in disuse that he bought in a, in a, at a cheap price. He later converted it into a house. Um, and it's sort of chock-a-block, like it's not a very um, coherent building. And there are issues like the stench coming in and a spiral staircase rescued from some shipwreck. So all of these details suggest a sense of uh, uh, something that's a wreck, something that's um, experienced loss. It's um, uh, And the description goes on to tell us that he intended on having a large family. He made five cubbyholes for the many children that he intended having. He doesn't. He has Santiago. So the house in its uh, dysfunction represents the, could be seen to represent the life that he actually lives, that um, Ibrahim Nasser uh, lives, and it's a, it's a life that doesn't turn out the way he wants or the way he intends. Um, his wife sits on a balcony to console herself for her solitude because she only has the one child and her husband dies. Um, <clears throat> so there are many mentions of solitude. Uh, if you've been paying attention, you could go backwards and look. Uh, this idea that um, everybody's ultimately alone that um, and that certainly we take our death, our journey into death alone, and Santiago does. He's completely isolated at the at the end when he when he dies. Um, so if you move on to uh, there's a lot of detail about where the doors are. So if you look here, there's a setup that Marquez is doing to make us ready for um, the murder scene, right? So the front door is where the twins wait. They know that it's always closed. They wait there. It's another one of their uh, tactics that they try in order to avoid killing Santiago. I mean, they... Uh, the obvious tactic is they keep telling everybody that they're looking for him to kill him, hoping that someone will stop them. That doesn't work. This is another tactic. They, they wait at the door that they know is closed and barred that he probably won't be using. Um, okay, so... But the odd thing that happens is that he goes... He does go out that door on this day because the bishop is visiting. So as it says, he, he went out that particular door um, in order to receive the bishop because he sees the bishop's visit as a special event and they use the front door for special events. 
So he does walk out that door, actually. Uh, the next paragraph <laughs> begins with a mention of fatal coincidences. So they're not actually coincidences, um, but, well, maybe I could say some, some of them are, but the, this feeds into the idea of the narrator trying to make sense of what has happened, right? Nothing seems to make sense. Everything seems like a mistake or an accident or a coincidence. Things that are supposed to happen don't happen. Things that aren't supposed to happen do happen. Um, and, and like the narrator, there are other people looking for a rational explanation. Um, this is a reference to the report written by the judge who comes in after the murder. <clears throat> Um, and people want to try to make sense of it, even this outsider, the judge, not just the narrator. Other people want to try to make sense of it, too. Um, and the report keeps talking about the fatal door. That is the front door that Santiago goes through. Um, and um, the, the narrator tells us, well, in reality, the only valid explanation seemed to be that of Placida Linero, who's um, Santiago's mother, right? She, sa she says, well, my son always goes out the front door when he's dressed up. Well, it's a special occasion. If he's dressed for a special occasion, he goes out the front door. It seemed to be such an easy truth that the investigator wrote it down as a marginal note, but didn't include it in the report. So we see that as people try to reconstruct the story, they ignore details. They are selective. They show a selectivity bias. And, and in this case, the, the investigator, uh, the, the investigating judge writing the report, he doesn't even pay attention to this sort of obvious, easy truth about why Santiago did uh, go out the door that he went out. <clears throat> All right. Now... The next paragraph begins with a comment that was made by Victoria Guzman, um, and it's a lie. She says neither she nor her daughter knew that the men were waiting for Santiago to kill him, but they did, right? And then the rest of this paragraph uh, explains the ways in which they did, right? So they'd been told it by a woman who had passed by after five o'clock to beg a bit of milk. So there's a warning. Right? She says, this whoever this woman is, says that the twins are looking for Santiago to kill him, but that warning is never repeated. We see this over and over and over again. People are warned or they hear from the twins themselves that the murder is going to take place and nobody does anything. There are so many opportunities to intervene, but none of them are taken. Um, and here is a, a quote from Victoria Guzman, and there's the word me again, uh, reminding us that this is the narrator who's interviewing people like a journalist would to try to put together this, the, the story. Um, and he is, of course, the one writing the chronicle that is referred to in the title, the, the chronicle of a death foretold. Um, that's exactly what the narrator is putting together as he interviews people and, and looks for documents and tries to reassemble the story. Um, so this is kind of like a reporter's story, uh, this, this quotation I have highlighted here, because this is how reporters work, this is how journalists work. They ask questions of people that they're interviewing, um, of victims or experts or observers or witnesses. They ask them questions, but they don't publish the question in the final story. They only publish the quotation that the person gives them. So in this case, we don't see the, the question that he asked her. We only see her answer. And that's what we would see if we were reading a newspaper story. Um, so clearly he's asked the question uh, it's quite clear if this woman came by and, and told you, why didn't you warn Santiago? And this is her answer. So uh, the drunkards refer to the twins being drunk. So if she's making up an excuse. All right? And then he finds out, nevertheless, Davina Flor confessed to me on a later visit after her mother had, had died that the mother hadn't said anything to Santiago Nasser because in the depths of her heart, she wanted them to kill him. Now, we already talked about Santiago's um, uh, machismo and his treatment of um, both Victoria Guzman and Divina Flor. Uh, so in her heart of hearts, 
Victoria doesn't say anything because she has no interest in protecting Santiago because she hates him. So she doesn't admit that to the narrator when she talks to him directly. He only finds out from her daughter years later. So we can also tell from this that the, the narrator has, has spent years investigating this, talking to people, trying to get the truth from people. Well, um, and, and people tell him lies or they avoid answering his questions or one person tells him one thing and another person tells him another thing. All the things that happen to a real journalist who's trying to investigate something. And But, but it's not just about journalism. It's about how we remember the truth and how we rationalize our relationship to the truth. Um, and how we, you know, excuse uh, things that we did or didn't do, um, all, all those things that feed into, uh, to be T-O-K, uh, things like memory, um, things like interpretation, uh, things like the use of language that feed into the ways that we tell stories about what's happened to us. Um, <clears throat> this is a bit of... Um, foreshadowing at the end of the paragraph that uh, his grip when he grabs uh, um, Davina already feels like the hand of a dead man. So the fact that we get sentences like this that are uh, images of death that foreshadow the death that we know that is going to happen, um, they, they make his death inevitable and yet really the whole point of the story is that it wasn't inevitable it could have been stopped but nobody stopped it it was certainly foretold but that doesn't make it inevitable okay we'll go down here a little bit to the next um paragraph um this might remind you of uh <laughs> something Donald Trump said about grabbing women by their private parts. Um, it's, it, it's a shocking, uh, it's a shocking statement because it shows how uncaring and how, um, what a sense of male privilege Santiago ha had. Um, but something's different this time. Um, she says, he always does that to me, but this time, that day, I didn't feel the usual surprise, but an awful urge to cry. So we get, we get from what she says that it's normal that she gets grabbed. He does it all the time. It was what he always did when he caught me alone. Um, so two things are happening here. We, we understand how normalized his behavior is, even though it's an assault. And we also understand that Davina Flor um, senses something different about that day. Mm. Okay, let us move down to um, Okay, the envelope under the door right here. Someone who was never identified had shoved an envelope under the door with a piece of paper warning Santiago Nasser that they were waiting for him to kill him. And in, in addition, the note revealed the place, the motive, and other quite dis precise details of the plot. Okay, so it's being shoved under the door, but not the door he goes out of. So he doesn't see it. And nobody finds this note with the warning until long after it's, you know, it's too late. So, um, so somebody is trying to warn them. Um, that could, we're not sure who writes that note. Maybe it's the twins themselves, but somebody does. Even Davina Floor takes the only action she can take right here. She leaves the door unbarred, the front door, so that he could get back in in case of emergency. So people take small actions to try to stop the murder, but none of them are um, effective. Okay. Um, there is always language like this, the two men who were waiting for Santiago Nasser in order to kill him. So even when the story is being retold, the twins are always identified as men who are waiting to kill somebody. And the reason that they're described like this just in the narrative is that everybody knows. Um, 
we can we can see if you go forward to let's go to um, Uh, Clotilde Armenta um, was the first to see him in the glow of dawn. So all this is, remember, all this is happening at six in the morning, right? And she had the impression that he was dressed in aluminum. This might remind you of that strange image uh, about the guts being seen as a bouquet of red roses. Um, it's not what she's seeing. She's not seeing somebody dressed in aluminum, but that's how her brain processes it. Um, because he looks, she she is saying in retrospect that he looked like a ghost. So you can see um, the story being constructed. You can see the townspeople telling themselves a story um, about what happened and how it happened and why it happened. Um, this makes, this description of him looking like a ghost makes it sound like he's already dead or he's already doomed, but, but he's not, he's alive, right? Um, she tries to postpone the murder at the end of that paragraph. She held her breath so as not to awaken them, the, the twins. Um, and there they are again, described them as the men who are going to kill him. Uh, so again and again, that's repeated to show that Everybody knows they're going to kill him, but nobody intervenes. Okay, uh, let's move to They Were Twins, this paragraph here. Um, okay, so uh, they have been drinking since um, the wedding, but this word is used. They'd done their duty and shaved. So... Uh, there are lots of interesting details in this paragraph that describes them, but I'm not going to look at every single one of them. Um, but they'd done their duty and shaved, like they make themselves presentable. Um, they shaved. Uh, that's, that's all they did. It's kind of ironic because their other duty is their duty to kill the man who apparently took their sister's virginity. Um, okay, let's go... forward to the, um, what happens with the bishop. Um, so at the end of this paragraph right here, um, they wake up and they grab their rolled up newspapers, which they're using to hide the knives, and they start to get up. And Clotilde says, all she can say is leave him for later, meaning Santiago, because, you know, the bishop's visiting and maybe we could delay this murder until the bishop's not here. Uh, so um, she does delay the murder. When they heard her, the Vicario twins reflected and the one who had stood up sat down again. They followed him with their eyes. So they don't kill him right away. They want to delay as much as Clotilde does. Uh, because they don't really want to commit this murder. So when she gives them an opportunity, she gives them an excuse to delay, they do delay. Um, all right. The bishop is supposed to come and bless the town. He doesn't. He doesn't even get off his boat. Um, you could read this as social commentary about the practice of Roman Catholicism. Uh, the town has prepared for this visit, um, from this respected religious authority. And what happens is that the boat shows up and he makes the sign of the cross and the boat turns around and leaves. So <clears throat> there will be no divine intervention in this murder. This is a bishop who's supposed to visit a town where two men are preparing to commit a murder. He doesn't. All he is is a fleeting illusion. So because the bishop doesn't visit, doesn't actually get off the boat, you could read this as an indication that, you know, that God or the divine is not going to intervene in this town's affairs. Um, the people who live in the town are the ones who have control. They're the only ones who can stop this murder. There isn't going to be any, any divine intervention to, to, um, stop this murder. And when he makes the sign of the cross, um, Marquez uses the word mechanically. He keeps on doing it mechanically, like he's a machine or like he's something, he's like the robot bishop, right? He doesn't 
care. He's not invested in the town. He doesn't actually do anything. He just shows up, makes the sign of the cross like a robot, leaves. Um, okay, so you could read that as a social commentary on the ineffectiveness of religion. Um, so go forward to... Um, Many of those on the dock, right here, many of those who were on the docks knew that they were going to kill Santiago Nasser. All right. Um, they refers to the twins, but we don't even need to say it at this point because it's been so clearly uh, reiterated so many times that, that the twins are the ones who are going to commit the murder and who are waiting to commit the murder. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so here's another person in authority, a colonel, uh, a retired colonel. Uh, he doesn't intervene either. Why doesn't he? He said, I had my own very real reasons for believing he wasn't in danger anymore. What are they? You might want to think about that. The priest, Father Amador, here, he doesn't intervene either. He's not worried. When I saw him safe and sound, I thought I had it had all been a fib, he told me. All right? He saw Santiago and he's like, oh, he's okay. What are they talking about? Um, no one even wondered whether Santiago Nasser had been warned because it seemed impossible to all that he hadn't. So that that's part of the excuse that people are making. And we have two authority figures in the town. One is a military authority and one is a religious authority. Um, and neither of them do anything. And they make an excuse afterwards about why they don't do anything. Here's a contrast transition. In reality, says the narrator, um, my sister Margot was one of the few people who still didn't know they were going to kill him. So everybody knows, nobody does anything, and this idea that, oh, I, I didn't do anything because I thought it would be okay, which everybody is now saying was the rationalizing as their position, that doesn't really apply to anybody. They're all making up a story about why, how they can excuse themselves for not doing anything. Um, <clears throat> and the narrator points that out by saying, well, in reality, there's only a very few people who didn't know that he was going to be killed. My sister was one of them. Um, Okay. Um, there are frequently sentences. Um, sorry, I just have to find it. Um, okay, down here. Uh, but no matter how much they tossed the story back and forth, no one could explain to me how poor Santiago Nasser ended up being involved in such a mix up. <laughs> So there are repeated statements throughout the whole novel about how nobody understands why Santiago is involved or people doubt that he actually did have sex with Angela. So that those sentences, if you should keep an eye out for those, those are repeated multiple times in multiple contexts. So that's Gabriel Garcia Marquez sowing the seeds of doubt in our minds about the justification for the murder itself. It's supposed to be an honor killing. If you haven't, you should look on the p-learning page and see uh, the material about honor killings that I posted there. It's supposed to, the point of it is to restore honor to a family that has been dishonored because their daughter lost her virginity. Okay, now I think the very basis of this is absurd, but um, it's even made more absurd by uh, the author pointing out that lots of people don't seem at all sure that it was Santiago that took her virginity. <clears throat> they know he got killed for it, but many of them seem to doubt that he was the one responsible. So if you're murdering to restore honor and you murder somebody who didn't do what you thought he was going to do, how does that work? That doesn't seem to restore any honor. Um, so again, we get the idea that the murder is pointless, it's absurd, it's ridiculous, it doesn't achieve anything. Uh, okay. Um, so, oddly, 
the narrator's mother says that she's going to warn her friend because she's a friend of Placida Lanero, who's um, Santiago's mother. Even the narrator's mother says he's she's going to go warn Placida, not Santiago, but Placida. Okay, if you're going to be logical about this, you would warn the guy who's in danger of getting murdered, not his mother. Um, <clears throat> and when her husband says, well, we we are related to the Vicarios as well as Santiago's family, um, the narrator's mother says, you always have to take the side of the dead. So that's another comment that suggests, you know, the inevitability of his death as if he's already dead. But what we know is that it could have been stopped and there were many opportunities to do so. So it's ironic that people treat him or see him as if he's already dead when in fact he could be saved. Okay, then the mother goes out. His brother wants to chase her um, down the street and he... Um, he hears her saying um, this, which seems to be a judgment on the twins. Um, at, seems to be the narrator's mother passing judgment on the twins um, and on what they intend to do. And then somebody who's never identified runs past them and says the last line of chapter one, which is don't bother yourself. They've already killed him. So <clears throat> that person who says that, our narrator says that he took pity on her madness. Um, is her madness that she's trying to intervene, that she's trying to issue a warning? Because it's it, at this point, it, she is told that it's too late and nothing can be done. 